Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the How and Why I Remain Unloving presentation, Jesus encourages us to consider why we do not make love the highest priority of our lives introduces the main denials, excuses, and justifications we use to remain unloving and outlines the most severe problem of a lack of personal will. Recorded on the 6th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, how are we doing this morning? Ready to go? Yes. Yep, sure? Yes. No worries. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yesterday we talked about the issues we face with regard to how we feel about love and the issues we face with regard to how we feel about change. And now we would like to look at the issues we face as to why or how and why we remain unloving, or how and why I remain unloving. And this discussion is really quite simple. And so I want to present you with some very simple facts about the reason why we remain unloving. I feel many of you are trying to complicate things in terms of why you're finding it hard to grow in love. And, and yesterday we saw that a lot of it's got to do with what you choose, right? what we continue to choose. And, and we choose things because we want to. We choose things because we feel that we'd like to do those things. And the, the main reason why we remain unloving is because we want to. Now that's the talk. I could walk off now <laughs> and my point is made. <laughs> But the, the thing I see many of you doing is you don't believe you want to remain unloving. You believe you want to become loving. And yet what I see you choosing frequently is to be unloving. So, so we've got to look at the methodology, the, the things that we do to remain unloving. What, what are the things that we try to do to remain unloving? And, and that's really simple as well. There's a number of basic things that we do. The first thing we do is we deny that we're unloving. <laughs> now, we've got a predisposition to that because as we talked about yesterday, the world's definition of love is very much different to God's definition of love. In fact, you could almost say the world's definition of love is actually God's definition of sin. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And you look at the world's definition of love. Remember we wrote down a number of those things yesterday, but things like sacrifice, well, that's God's definition of sin. Uh, things like doing things for other people in order to have them do something for you, well, that's God's definition of sin as well. Feeding another person's addiction, well, that's God's definition of sin as well. Uh, trying to make out that everything's fine when it's not, well, that's God's definition of sin as well. That's called a lie, <laughs> right? And that's God's definition of sin as well. So, so the reality is the world's definition of love is actually equal to God's definition of sin. And so it becomes very, very easy for us to deny that we're unloving while we're living in the world. Because the world says, no, no, that's not unloving. That's the right thing to do. That's the proper thing you should do. That's what you do when you love somebody. And God's going, no, it's not. And, and in fact, God's showing you through the law, through God's laws, that it's not the right thing because of all the pain and suffering that we're receiving as a result of what we choose to do. But we're still going, no, 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 no. The world's definition of love is true, and I'm doing what that is, so I'm already loving. And this is what I feel the, ma the majority of you are actually doing. You're actually convinced yourself that you are loving when you're not from God's perspective. Does that make sense? So this assists us to deny that we're even unloving. And denying that you're unloving, 
means that you will never probably change. So you'll never, never see the necessity to change in that place. And I, f I see most of you engaging this every single day. You deny that you've been unloving when actually you have been unloving from God's perspective. And this is why it's so important to get God's definition of love. Because we convince ourselves otherwise that we're loving when we're not. So that's a big, that's a big problem. Is there any questions about that as an issue? That is a big issue for many of you, right? Big issue. And that's the reason why. So it's got nothing to do with all this complicated stuff about having to find the emotion in your childhood and all those kind of things. You don't even think you've done anything wrong before you even begin most of the time. Do you follow? So Tara, you'd like to ask? I actually find that I really do know when I'm being unloving. Yeah, I can't agree, Tara. Uh, Mary's had many conversations with you about the things that you've raised with her and al in almost every conversation with her you're unloving towards her. Okay. No, but you don't even know that. No, I mean... So I, I so can't not, agree. Not everything that I'm doing, obviously, but, but when I realise that I am unloving, I am aware of it. Not... not Yes, yeah, but there's really. still the underlying, and we'll get to the other things that we do, yeah. that happen even when you do recognise that there is an action that's unloving. Now, yeah. I know that you see this with your children, like where you've acted unlovingly towards your children. Yeah. But then you do a number of other things, right, with that. And, and we'll get into those now. Sure. Yeah, rather than... <laughs> but can everyone see the point of the denial? The point of the denial is if I can say, I'm already loving, then I don't need to look at anything. Right? And that's what the majority of us want to do. We don't want to look at anything. Right? And we're getting older, we get sicker, we, 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 we die from diseases and all sorts of things in the process, but we just still tell ourselves that, that that's all externals, that's nothing to do with me. It's happening to you, but it's nothing to do with you. <laughs> nothing to do with what you've created. And this is a big problem. Denial is a, a huge problem in the world, as you know. Uh, denial of everything, pretty much. And this problem that the world's definition of love is from God's perspective sin is a huge problem for us to reverse. It's something we need to reverse. You follow? Okay, so what's the next thing we do? We excuse ourselves. And of course the plural of that is we make many excuses. For ourselves too but we also we excuse ourselves in the sense that we go no one's perfect it's the human condition to be imperfect it's okay to be imperfect everyone should be able to be imperfect now what's God's definition of imperfection God's definition of imperfection is every time you're out of harmony with truth and love that's God's definition of imperfection God doesn't care how many mistakes you make other than that does that make sense? So you can have mistakes in knowledge, mistakes in ability, you can, you can have accidents or whatever else you need to do or want to do. You can, you can do all of these things, but as soon as you do something out of harmony with love, from God's perspective, you've made a mistake. Right? But we say, but that's normal to make, to make those kind of mistakes, to make unloving mistakes. It's normal to tell little white lies. It's normal to withhold the truth. It's normal to not be transparent. You've got to have privacy and you've got to have, you know, we, we come up with all these different argumentations as to why we don't honour truth and love. And we're, we're excusing it the entire time. That's what we're doing. We're making excuses for ourselves. Now, many of us are really good at that really good at making excuses for ourselves another thing we do we we minimize what's happened or what's happening remember yesterday I talked about the contrast between a terrorist bombing something and how much it splashed across the news and a hundred million children dying every year and how little anything said about it that gives you an example of what we do. When it connects with our fears, we'll talk about it. When, 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 it, when the problem looks to be so big that it's unsolvable, we, don't, we, we brush it under the carpet. We make it out, it's not even there. Uh, sad. 
but we minimize it. We also do another thing. We justify our actions to remain unloving. Uh, many of you do this with fear. You, you sort of see fear as your justification to be unloving. So, so whenever your fear is triggered, that's your justification to get angry. You see? But ang ang getting angry with other people is unloving, right? But your justification to get angry is based uh, upon you denying your fear. So you go, well, if I'm afraid, then all bets are off. If I'm afraid, then I'm allowed to take action that's going to harm another person. If it looks like they're going to harm me, then I'm allowed to harm them first. Or if they've harmed me in the past, there's a high likelihood they'll harm me in the future, so I'm going to do something about that now. There's all these justifications we're using to stay unloving. Justifications like, but I might get raped or I might get murdered if I am loving in this particular situation. So what we do is we, we do the unloving thing instead because we, we only want to protect ourselves, which is really just fear again. This is what we do. Okay? Another thing we do. Blame others. I was unloving, but you did this and you did that and you did this, so what else did you expect? <laughs> that kind of thing. Or we go, yes, I was unloving, but you know, what was done to me in my childhood was pretty bad and that's why I'm unloving. Or, yes, I'm unloving, but don't you know I was abused? As if abuse, so you, somebody abusing you gives you justified, justification to abuse someone else. Isn't that just shifting the blame from your own decisions and behaviour? And if none of those work, we have a tendency to do this one. <laughs> just straight out lie. <laughs> No, I didn't do that. Like, you see people who get caught in the world media about some things, it's always like, oh, no, I didn't do that, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do this. And then you find out later they did all those things, you know. Are any of you interested in soccer? Isn't that what happened in the soccer, in the FIFA recently? Same kind of thing. No, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. And then there's a whole written trial of it all occurring. <laughs> oh, yes, I did do it, but and then you shift on to some others, right? Cleaner. What about blame of ourselves and blame of God? Honestly, I don't believe many of you actually do that. Yeah, I don't believe many of you do it. Some do, but you do it after some of these other things don't work. But really, you know, most of these things have a tendency to work, so you use these techniques. Yeah. Of course, you could finish up blaming yourself, but, but very few of you do in the sense of taking responsibility. Like, taking responsibility is di different than blaming yourself. Taking responsibility, in fact, what I see many of you doing with regard to blame yourself, that you pointed out, Glenda, is that you, finish, you blame yourself so that you don't have to actually put the responsibility on the person who actually did it. And why do you do that? Because you want to deny that you're afraid of them. You want to excuse their behaviour. You want to minimise their behaviour and justify to yourself their behaviour and lie about their behaviour. So it's pretty much the same motivation in the end, you see. And it's all done because we don't want to feel some things, isn't it, really? That's what it really boils down to. Okay. That's how we remain unloving. That's it. Pretty simple, huh? Yeah. Now, we have a tendency to re do these things in particular four different areas that we started to raise with you yesterday. The four different areas are with regard, firstly, to faith. In other words, we do things like with faith like deny that we could even have any. 
It's impossible to have faith in a person you can't see, right? In God, a person you can't see. It's poss impossible to have faith in love because the majority of you have had a lot of heartache with love, so you, how do you have faith in it? You can't. So, so this is how you deny that faith is even important to you. You deny even the development of it. You even go so far as to go, well, if I've got a lack of faith, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's God's fault. You know, if God just came down and just, you know, showed himself off occasionally, like once per generation even would do, then, then I would have some faith that he exists, right? Not, not understanding that it's actually, a, it's actually physically impossible for God to do such a thing and you survive the event. <laughs> All right? but, but this is where we go with it, right? We're not, we don't use much logic in most of our demands. So, so what we finish up doing with faith is we finish up denying that we should even have any. We excuse ourselves for not having any. We minimise to ourselves that it's not, we say to ourselves it's not very important. We justify the lack of faith because of how everyone else has treated us and families treated us and so forth. We blame others for our lack of faith. You know, it's like it's the religion's fault and the, it's the minister's fault and the priest's fault. You know, all those pedophile priests, well, it's their fault. And, and we blame a whole heap of other people for it being their fault. And we even blame things like science and other things, like as if they know the truth about God nobody's ever met God enough to know you know that's so so they we justify that and we go oh, okay um, you know scientists haven't proven the existence of God or or not proven the existence of God so I'd prefer to not believe in God <laughs> so that doesn't make much sense to me either like why would you choose to not believe in something just because something is not yet proven to be through general methods and then we lie about our faith even we go yeah i've got an immense amount of faith isn't it wonderful how much faith in god i've got when really i'm just angry and annoyed with god and frustrated with god and those kind of emotions that's what we do and then we also do a similar thing with the development of faith we go well it's not my, it's not up to me to develop my faith somebody else should do it for me we don't even take responsibility for the development of our own faith. What's going on, guys? There's a lot of very solemn faces in front of me. <laughs> Natalie, thank you. <clears throat> I feel like I've had moments where some faith has developed. I've had an experience that gives me faith that God loves me and that God is real. Mm -hmm. But those experiences then seem to be far and few between. And so it's almost like I denied the experience even happened. Yeah, I know. Why do you do that? I don't know. So that you don't have to have the next experience. Okay. And so that the faith doesn't build. If the faith builds to be too higher than your fear, then you'll have to do something different with your life. Yeah. And you don't want to. As we talked about yesterday, we don't want to change. Yeah. So, so we're choosing to not change, and if our faith is too big, then we'll change. And it feels almost um, like when I reflect on those moments where I've had that faith building, because I remember them very clearly, mm -hmm. it creates like this turmoil inside myself of, well, what am I doing, you know? Like that's, I, that's right, I it have does. a logical experience here. I have something almost tangible, yeah. and yet I still make an excuse to just not... That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Your desire to make the excuse. It, that that feels painful. Like it, it Well, you know, it's not obviously not painful enough for most of you. Yeah. Because if, if it was that you'd probably do something different, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is what we continuously do. It's like like we're we're addicted to doubt. Yeah. We are. It's an addiction. It's not even a real emotion a lot of times, it's just an addiction. Doubt allows us to not make changes. We can say, oh, it's all fascinating and wonderful, but not I don't have enough faith in it yet to actually change my whole life because of it. So what I'll do is I'll just, you know, it's like tyre kicking a car without testing the thing, you know, that's what we do. We, we, we only wish to examine, it, examine the bits of it that mean that we don't have to do anything. And I also find it ironic that when I reflect on those times, they're some of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. Of course they are. But, but we refuse to reflect upon those times generally 
because we don't want to make the next step. The next step feels pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, because the next step has a lot of discomfort. You know, all those things that we were worried about with change, yeah. the next step has that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we even deny the experiences that have already built our faith. That's what we choose to do. And we've got to get to this underlying understanding inside of ourselves. That is our fault <laughs> and responsibility. And as a group, this group does not wish to take personal responsibility. So this is a big issue for you guys. Not wanting to take personal responsibility for the choices and decisions that are being made. Many of you have lived a life where you defer responsibility onto others. For, for many of you, you defer responsibility of the decisions you make onto spirits when they're actually your decisions. You defer the responsibility on the spirits because you don't want to take responsibility. Many of you continue to defer responsibility onto other people, including your own parents, rather than making a decision to do something different. Many of you blame the people around you quite readily for things not going well in your life. Right? This issue of taking personal responsibility, big issue. If I have a lack of faith, I get to a point when I'm a grown-up. A grown-up takes responsibility for their current life, their current choices, their current decisions, their current life. That's what a grown-up does. A child, remember we said yesterday, a child, just a babe in arms, a nursing child, is very dependent upon others. But the whole point of growing up is to stop being dependent on others and start just being dependent on God and then yourself. God wants you to take personal responsibility for your life. Right. So whenever you say, I've got no faith, it's because of whatever external thing. That's not true. The lack of faith is because of the choices we've made to remain in a state of a lack of faith. And that's a choice, a decision we've made. And we need to see it as such, an actual choice, an exercise of our will. That's what it is. Right. Now we do the same with another issue and that is the issue of truth and this is a big issue a very big issue many of you are terrified of truth terrified well that's your resistance to truth a person who loves truth does not feel terrified of truth and if a person understood the true power of it of truth itself they would never avoid it ever in their life they would never avoid telling others it. You'd, they'd never avoid confessing the truth to, uh, to others about the things they've done. And they would never avoid even things like transparency. They'd never avoid that. Now, there's not a single one of you here that is actually transparent with your life. Not a single one of you. Even when it comes to just basic things like your personal finances. So we've given an example of that. We're, Mary and I have been putting our personal finances on the internet now for four, year, four years. We've, been, we've done it the last four years straight. None of you have done it. But you expect the government to do it and you expect companies to do it, right? You expect people to openly disclose what's really going on financially within their organisations and particularly in governments and yet you're not leading that charge by doing it in your own life. It doesn't matter whether nobody's interested or not. What matters is it's you just choosing to be leaders with transparency. That's all it is. But none of you have chosen to do that. For all sorts of reasons. Right. And, and yet many of you, how many of you have Facebook pages? Right. More than half. Many of you have a, already a way to do it, <laughs> but, but you're afraid of something, otherwise you wouldn't. Or you think that it's you know, not important. Either one's a problem, because truth is important, transparency is important. We need to be leaders with it, and yet you're waiting for other people to lead you. And yet you've heard Divine Truth, many of you, for five, six, seven, eight years. Still haven't done it. 
So the truth isn't motivating you. It's not changing your life. You're not, you're not honouring it. Does that make sense? And that's just one tiny little example. Tiny little example. We deny the truth, we excuse it, we minimise it, we justify it, we blame others for it. We do exactly the same thing as we do with our faith. And yet it is our personal responsibility to discover the truth. It's our personal responsibility. Many times, and, and I, might, I must make this comment, up to now the majority of you who have written down feedback issues have tried to place the responsibility of the discovery of your truth on me. Right? Huh? Because you don't want to feel, the majority of you do not want to feel what the truth actually is. That's the only reason why you can't feel it, because you don't want to feel it. I know that about myself. Anything that I've got a problem of, I know it's because I don't want to. And it's time that each of you started saying, well, hang on a sec, if I don't know something, it's because I don't want to. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Instead of going, oh, I really do want to, I really do want to, when you don't. Alex, please. Um, well, I just got the answer to my question this morning, and it's relating to this responsibility and um, why I don't want to um, feel my sin. And um, <clears throat> my guide said this morning that you don't want to take responsibility, and I couldn't w work out the link. I can't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it is true, Alex. You don't yeah. want to take responsibility for the choices that you're making, in particular the choices you're making to defer a lot of the choices and decisions in your life to the spirits that are around you. You don't want to see the choice you're making there. And you don't want to take... Res and that's because you don't want to take responsibility for your own life. You want somebody to show you or tell you what to do. Honestly, if I wanted to be a cult leader, you guys would be stuffed. It's fortunate that I don't want to be one. It's fortunate that all I do want to do is just teach the truth and that's it. Because a, a cult leader would actually take advantage of the majority of you by just telling you what to do, telling you what to do, feeding addiction here, feeding addiction there, giving you what you want here, giving you what you want there. And, and before you know it, you're automations of the person who's leading you. And that's not what we want to do here. What we want to do here is help you each become individual people who have their wills fully engaged. In other words, you know what you want. You know what you desire. You know what you need to do. You, you take responsibility for the choices and decisions you make. You, you do not deny, excuse, minimise, justify, blame others or lie about the situation you're in. You face up to all of that because you're personally responsible for your choices in your life. That's what we want you to be. Most of you have resisted that process heavily because you desperately want somebody else to do all of those things for you. And that is a problem. It's not going to help you get closer to God at all. So we've got to Natalie and then down to Amber. Is it... I feel like this fear... I understand what you're saying when you say the fear of truth mm -hmm. and yet whenever you've told me the truth about something, I may not like what you say, but I don't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't feel afraid of it anymore. I, I actually sit and think and go, well, geez, I've got to work this out. There's an example of you lying to yourself, Natalie. Okay. You say you may not like what I say, but you're not afraid of it anymore. The fact that you don't like what I say is indicating you are afraid of it still. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once you really love the truth, you will love it with your whole heart. It's not like you, you will never be afraid of it, ever. And, and you'll just, you know, you'll be thirsty for it, thirsty for it. It, it. it would be a strong desire in you. And yet for the majority of you in this group, what I feel is, I, I like, hope he doesn't talk to me because he, he might tell me something I don't want to hear, right? That's what I feel from the majority. Okay. Right? So this is a rejection of truth, not, not, a lo not a love of truth. What I'm suggesting to you is there needs to be inside of ourselves a love of truth. Does it tie in with our faith? Sorry? Does that, that love of truth tie in with our faith? Of course they all tie together. But, but at the end of the day, truth is the thing that sets you free. Right? 
I didn't say those words in the first century for nothing. That is the exact truth. It does set you free. It's the, it's the gateway to even being loved. Remember, truth and love are joined at the hip. You can't, in fact, love somebody without telling them the truth. You can't be loved by God without God sharing the truth about you with you. Do you understand that? Uh, many of you don't understand that. You, you think you can be loved by God without God sharing any truth with you. You think you can have ask for God's love while at the same time reject God's truth. And you can't. And, and I've told you that for years that you can't. But you're still trying to do it. It's like you, you're, trying, you're still in this negotiation with God, right? It's sort of like... Oh, God, you know, why don't you just drop the truth issue? You know, just give me a bit of love. Drop the truth issue. You know, stop telling, you talk to the hand about the truth, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, rah, 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 rah. Now give me some love, like, as if God's ever going to do that. But that's what we want God to do. In fact, if you think about it, we even want our very closest companions to do that with us. Not only God, we want our lover or whoever we're you know, partnering, we want them to do that. We want our friends to do that. So, so of course we're going to want God to do it. And God's saying, no, that's not love. That's not love. That's the world's definition of love. You know? The world's definition of love is, does my, jeans look fat, my bum look fat in these jeans? And you go, no, darling, they look great, even though it is fat. Right? Like that, that's the world's definition of love. Don't hurt anybody with the truth, is the, is the concept of truth. The truth hurts. No, it doesn't. It's the lies that hurt. Right? The truth doesn't hurt at all. The truth is wonderful. The truth is the only way that you can grow and expand towards anything. Like This is why scientists spend their entire life trying to discover truths, even just physical ones. Because without knowing the truth, there's whole heaps of problems that we face that we can't resolve. And, and it's only by finding the truth about them that we can resolve them. Isn't that wonderful? So, so again, it's something we're searching for physically, but we're in complete denial of emotionally and spiritually. So most, of, most scientists are still searching for physical solutions, physical truth, if you like, about things. They're passionate about that. And most of you listen to every word they talk about when they discover something. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's fascinating. It's beautiful. Wow, it's just going to affect so much of our life. And, and it already has, by the way. Like 100 years ago, you couldn't fly, and now you can. And 100 years ago, you didn't carry around a tiny little thing that you could talk on. You know, that was only like, you know, 50 years ago, that was still in somebody's imagination. It wasn't yet even reality then. And, and yet we're doing it now. Right. So, so what's going to happen in the next few hundred years? Well, that's going to depend on scientists discovering more truth, but just physical truth. And what I'm suggesting to you is, if physical truth can add to the comfort and happiness of your life, don't you think that spiritual and emotional truth is going to add to the comfort and happiness of your life more? Of course it is. So why are we so resistive? Because we want to be. There's no other reason for it. We want to. We're choosing to. We're, we're using our will to. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Jennifer, thanks. I think I know better. That's why I'm just analysing my life and the people closest to me and I keep on coming up with, I think I know better. Mm. I think I know how to make their life better. Mm. Yeah, so I, I'm actually I, making their life worse because I'm doing that. Yeah, you know, unless we actually are educated by God in love, we don't know better, do we? It's just another flavour of the same wrong. <laughs> That's all it is. And on this planet, we've basically got seven billion flavours of wrong. And that's why my, you know, we've got seven billion unhappy people. Because we've got seven billion flavours of wrong. What we need to do is get one flavour of right. But that only comes from God. That's the only source of that. 
And, and while we're denying these basic principles, denying these basic things, we'll never have the connection of God. So remember yesterday, the reason why I'm raising all of these things is to help you get this connection with God and to help you see what's preventing it. Because unless we get the connection with God, we can't receive truth and love from the source. If we don't receive truth and love from the source, we can't get education in love. If we don't get education in love, we can't grow. We're going to end up the same as what all the world finishes up ending up if we keep doing what the world keeps doing. So this, the point of these discussions are not to like give you a kick in the bum or any of those kind of things. It's to show you where you're rejecting God. Do you understand? Where you're keeping him at bay, her, whatever, however you want to think of God, keeping her at bay. You're rejecting her love. You're pushing her away from you. You're pushing him away from you. You're trying to control how his laws work. And I'm sorry, but that's like just an argument with God in the end. And God doesn't argue. God just does. So this is what we need to come face to face with. Ben, thanks. Oh, sorry, Amber. That's yep, okay. You've been hanging out for a while. Um, <laughs> I was just... Um, my question isn't that clear in my mind yet. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around how to explain it. Um, There's if, a lot of preamble in your questions, Amber. Can you skip them, please? Yes. Thanks. Um, if I use my will truthfully, like even in the unloving parts of my will, but somewhere in me I don't know whether they're loving or not. If I, if I use my will just truthfully like what I want to do because I don't know much about myself, is that a better place to start than just being wishy-washy with stuff? No, I don't believe so. It's quite easy to tell when something's loving. All you've got to do is ask yourself, would you like it done to you? What you're doing to another, would you like it done to you? What you're doing to the earth, would you like somebody else to do the same thing to the earth? To, what you're doing to somebody else's place, would you like them to do it to your place? All you've got to do is ask yourself the basic principles of ethics and you'll go to 90% resolution of pretty much most loving behaviour. That's all you've got to do. So it's quite simple to decide. I, I find it hard making decisions. Well, that's because you don't want to do the next thing that I'm going to list on the board. So we'll get to the next thing in a minute. Let's come across to Ben. Uh, I like gave up on truth so yep. completely that I was like just waiting to die to yep. find out something yeah and just completely yep. like, just totally gone yeah that's rooted in like re responsibility lack of re not wanting to be responsible for your life or when we give up on things it's actually an act of anger of rage if you like to understand we need to see it as such we're angry about the fact that we think there's no truth and then what we do is we decide, oh, I'm just going to... We go into either a passive state of anger, which is, which is called passive aggression in psychological terms, where you basically sit immovable, not shifting in any direction, right? which is basically the state that you describe. Right? Yeah, not I was like burning up in rage. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The reality is uh, it's right. driven by anger and the anger about truth frequent, well, all the time comes from our childhood again because most of the time in our childhood we were lied to, we were told, you know, we were told that under some circumstances you have to tell the truth and under other circumstances you must never tell the truth. Now how confusing is that? It's not true. It was like a Giving up on the tr truth is like a total state of confusion. confusion. Yeah, and it is a total state of confusion. And, and it comes from confusion in your childhood about truth. Uh, later on in the week, we'll be playing a song. It's a teaching song that uh, they use for teaching children, and it's called the Truth Song. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but we'll play it. And, and if, you can, if you come in during that break, we'll let you know when it's happening. And just listen to the words of the song, you'll see you know, where a lot of our belief systems come about truth. You know, and it's all about you know, how we've been treated and what people say to us and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, Zoe's been playing it. From, she was here last week. Oh, she, yeah, she's been playing it, has she? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, can we, Grant, you want to just ask and then we'll move on to the next important one. Um, when you said about we can have a bit of an idea to whether something's loving or not, 
um, by what you said. What if it's like I'm helping somebody avoid their emotions and I like somebody to help me avoid my emotions or I'm feeding somebody's addictions and I like them feeding, feeding yours feed my addictions yeah you know? no i agree that, that obviously that we need to get god's view of those things certainly but but most of the time when we take actions we're we're not considering you know and by the way most of you have been educated to consider addiction by now you've had you know years of education about addiction most of you have been educated about you know emotions and so you've had years of education about the fact that we shouldn't be saving somebody from their emotion and some people shouldn't be choosing to save us from emotion that's not the way to go but you still do it most people still do it and this is where i'm saying there's it, when does it turn into an accidental act from an accidental act to a purposeful one well when you've become educated in a certain direction and you still choose to do what you know the original thing was that you do that's when it becomes a purposeful decision and this is what we need to take responsibility for. You, many of you have gained some awareness of emotion. Is that not true? Over the years of listening to God's truth, you have gained some awareness of emotion. So when are you going to stop stopping other people's emotion and stopping your own emotion? That, isn't that now a choice that you need to make based on what you already know to be true? So, so I feel that, yes, there are a whole, whole heap of people in the world who don't understand that feeding addictions is not a good thing. Although, if we look at it physically, feeding addiction for drugs, not a good thing. Feeding an addiction for alcohol, not a good thing. Feeding addiction for cigarette smoking, not a good thing. Feeding addiction for food, not a good thing. Everyone gets fat who does that. <laughs> you know, so we've had plenty of, um, uh, of evidence, physical evidence, that feeding an addiction is, is the wrong thing. And yet we still go ahead and do it. And this is what I'm talking about. At some point we have to say, well, hang on a sec, this is a choice I'm making rather than just not knowing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, can I move on to the next one? Because there's two more to go, obviously. So the next one is action. We want to talk more about this. We deny that any action is necessary. We excuse our bad actions and we excuse our lack of desire to take any good actions. We minimise our bad actions or minimise our lack of desire to take any good actions. We justify our bad actions. <laughs> and when I say bad, I'm using it loosely in terms of disharmonious with love and truth. I blame others for my actions. Or... I even lie about my actions. <laughs> right, we do all the same things again, don't we? Right. And we've got to see that that again is a choice. So can you see what we're trying to emphasise to you is this issue um, of choice, which of course is the gift that God gave you to make a decision, to make a choice, this issue of choice or decision making that we're involved in every single moment of every single day of our lives is the thing that needs to change. Because it's the choices we're making that cause us to keep getting the same results. Right? So it's a lot to do with the choices we're making. The choice to not act, what's that primarily based upon? Well, it's based upon the fear of what the outcome will be, isn't it? If we act in harmony with love here, I might get attacked. I don't want to be attacked, so I'm not going to act in harmony with love. Quite simple, isn't it? It's just a decision to not get attacked. That's what I'd classify as a lack of courage. Another quality that needs to be developed. Right. So we go through the same process. And then the very worst one that we go through is probably um, our emotional state, right? We do this thing with all of our emotions, remembering that our emotions are really the engine room. That, that's the engine that drives most of our actions. Does that make sense? So, so most of our thoughts, most of our words, most of our actions with other people, most of our... Um, desires even, are driven by the, these underlying emotions. Now, if our emotions are out of harmony with love, then the automatic result will be 
a choice out of harmony with love and therefore the automatic result will be pain and suffering for any person involved in that choice and and we don't care who's involved in our choices even most of the time do we we're just like i'm just going to do this i'm going to do that we we also we all sort of have this idea that we're sort of letting li living and let living you know that kind of idea i'm letting you live i'll live my own way you live your own way as if as if that's the right thing to do it's not the right thing to do because i've got to consider how my actions how my speech and words even and also primarily how my emotions and the and the decisions i make in my life affect you so i can't just i just can't go around going i can do anything i want as long as i'm not hurting anybody when i don't even know how i'm hurting you <laughs> i need to i need to find out i need to discover these things right so dealing with this emotion is a big thing but what do we do with it we do the same we deny we have it we excuse it when somebody does expose it we minimize it we justify it we blame others for it and we lie about it even when we know we're lying we lie about it <laughs> that's what we do and then we say that we really want to get closer to god and we really want to be feel more loved and we really want do we do we really want these things really are we being honest with ourselves really right and this is where the self analysis is so important and what i notice is the majority of you want me to analyze you that in itself is a demand upon another isn't it that's actually unloving it also betrays a lack of responsibility for your own life surely you learning how to analyze you is the best thing to do isn't that you analyzing you but to do that you're going to have to have a lot of desire for truth and honesty aren't you yeah Teresa thanks so coming down <clears throat> um what i feel i do when i'm anal analyzing myself mm -hmm. is put the worst possible oh, i don't know scenario just can i tell you what you do yeah, okay. is that all right because yeah. <laughs> everybody here does it you you judge yourself don't you yeah yeah and what have you learned about that that is a huge avoidance yes it is um, so it's actually a, judging yourself it comes from a d lack of desire to take responsibility And you know that's a big problem in your life. Yes. Yeah, financially and otherwise, yeah. just not taking responsibility for the choice and decision you're making, wanting other people to help you out when you've made a mistake, rather than bearing the consequences of your mistakes. Mm. Yeah. Judging yourself is a great way to avoid taking responsibility for your choice and decisions. What it also does is it basically, and and it's a learned behaviour from your childhood, right? it basically is done because when our parents thought we did something wrong they generally judged us or were condescending with us or even got violently disapproving with us right belted us or whatever and we learnt after a while that the way we analyze ourselves <laughs> is that we take the blame for the things that the parents want us to take the blame for and as long as we took the blame we avoided the punishment yeah. right so so it's a learned response and 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 so now as adults that's what we do we go okay somebody's blaming me for something i've done something wrong i've got to just blame myself and get on myself about it and everyone will everyone will stay off my case then yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone will leave me alone then if i as long as i do that to me everyone else will leave me alone about it yeah. but that's not taking responsibility for what you've done 
A person who takes responsibility wants to right the wrong. A person who takes responsibility doesn't expect other people to leave them alone when they themselves have done something wrong to hurt those other people. A person who takes responsibility wants to redress the issue. Right? And judging oneself doesn't accomplish any of those things. Yep. So it's a big issue for many people, yep. judging yourself. Anything else you want to add? How do I know the difference? How do I work, learn the difference between I'm judging myself and I'm actually being real about something? Can I say to all of you that you're asking me questions which betray a lack of desire to take responsibility even for finding the answer? Like, this is what I notice most of you doing. Do I ask you how I should do it? Have I ever asked you how I should do it? No, I haven't. Don't you think at times I'm confused about how to do it? Of course. Who do I ask? God. And if God doesn't give me the answer, what do I know? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Mm. Right? And so what do I do then? Mm. I look at why I don't want to know. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to help you guys do <laughs> this two days. This two days is about analysing your desire to, de to develop your will, analysing your desire to be loving, analyse your desire for love and change. And what I'm basically suggesting to you is that any changes that are not happening are because you don't want them to happen. And the best thing you could possibly do is face up to that truth and then want to know, want to know about it, want, may, desire it for yourself to know. Mm -hmm. Now there's a whole heap of things inside of myself I don't want to know yet. If, if, if that wasn't true, I'd already be at one with God. You follow? Yeah. So there's still things inside of myself, but I don't put it all on you. Mm. And I don't say, tell me what my this issue is and tell me what this cause of that is and tell me this and tell me that. Why? Because I know that as soon as I don't know something that I'm not getting the answer from God from for, I know that it's because I didn't want to know. And what's the point of asking you about it when I don't want to know about it? <laughs> Surely what I need to do first is fix that I don't want to know. Then, ah, oh, then God will be able to tell me anyway, and then I won't need to ask you. Mm -hmm. So basically what that means then is that you have no responsibility to help me. Isn't that wonderful? You don't feel the burden of having to help me. Yeah. You follow? Because yeah. it is a burden having to help other people when, when you're own, you're, you yourself are struggling for helping yourself. It is a burden. Is it not? Don't you feel that? Like if somebody, if you live with a person and all they ever want you to do is help them, help them, help them, help them, help them, help them. After a while you become exhausted. Helping them, helping them, helping them. Right? And what I'm suggesting to you is no, God's willing to help you. As soon as you don't know the answer to a question, it's because you don't want to know. Face that one truth. Face that one truth. I don't want to to know and then ask yourself the question do I want to change that do I want to change that because that is an exercise of my will right. now I've had these kind of conversations with Mary to a, to a much like more strongly worded than I am with you and yet many of you feel like you're getting kicked in the butt backside or something. But the reality is we need to all come to this conclusion that if we're not hearing from God about ourselves, it's not because of something God has done. Most of you are still blaming God for, for, for the lack of communication between yourself and God. And God's doing everything God possibly can do. To communicate with you god constructed an entire universe to communicate with you god created these feedback systems called the law of attraction law of cause and effect law of compensation to communicate with you god also is willing to communicate with you directly through your emotions and if all of that is happening and you still don't know something it's it's not because of god not wanting to help you know it can only be one reason, it's because I don't want to know. You follow? I don't want to. God's not like this unloving parent that goes, I'm going to withhold a whole heap of information from you 
I, I know that you desperately want to know it, but I'm going to withhold it because it makes me feel superior or some other crazy thing that you think God feels. No, God's not like your parents, you know. God wants to share truth with you. God wants to share information with you. God wants to help you with your own life. God wants you to become happy. God wants you. God is good. God is good. God wants to share these things with you. And if, 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 if you're not fear receiving these things, then stop blaming God for that and start seeing that it's because you do not want to receive these things. And that's what needs to be fixed. Do you follow? Yeah. Yep. Very important to get that point. God's good. Let yourself feel for a moment. If you really believed God was good, how would you be acting here? Would you, be, would you be still thinking that whenever you pray and you're not receiving love that it's God's fault? Or would you be going, well, maybe I don't want it. What, what is the reason inside of myself that I don't want it? You need to allow yourself to understand this basic truth. Allah Akbar. God is good. That's what you need to understand. If you understand that, it will help you a lot. Because whenever there's a lack of communication between yourself and God, you know that it can't be God doing it. <laughs> and that's very helpful to know that. You see, the problem with a relationship on earth is that if I have a lack, something going wrong with my relationship with Mary, right? both of us are imperfect, imperfect, aren't we? Both of us, it may be my problem or it may be Mary's problem, right? But if I'm trying to talk to God and I'm not hearing anything in return, in terms of not hearing the words but feeling the feelings from God, then, then and I know God hasn't got the problem, so it tells me straight away what the problem is. I don't want to. I, there's something inside of me that does not want me to do this. And, I, and, do, and then the question, as I said, becomes, do I want to change that? Now I'm suggesting to, to each of you that if you really had a developed sense of your will, you would want to change the things that cause you pain. And you would want to also improve the things that cause you pleasure. Right? And later in the, in the week we'll be talking about pain and pleasure and the relationship between these two things. Right? But, but for the moment we need to understand that our pain is caused by our choices and decisions that we're making every single moment of every single day. And that is the exercise of our will. And that's a very important thing to understand. So, and, and it applies to me as much as it applies to you. Like if I have a physical problem, it applies to me. If I have an accident, it applies to me. I'm not, I'm not sort of exempt from the same laws that you're governed by. Every single being in the universe is governed by these laws. None of us are exempt. So one of you gets cancer and the other one doesn't, there's got to be a law that governs one of you getting cancer and the other one not. Does that make sense? If one of you has an accident and the other one doesn't, there's got to be a law that governs the person having an accident compared to the one that didn't have one. Right. And I have accidents, and I still have sicknesses. And that will continue until I want to hear from God on every subject. And if you have some faith in that, you'll make a lot of progress. Yep. Sandra? Um, you talked about taking responsibility for our feelings and um, finding out what's really going on with us, but I've tried it many times and it seems like I'm not really picking up the truth because what you told me yesterday was just something that I could not see coming. I just couldn't see that it was coming. Sandra, I'm not going to ask you to ask any more questions. 
because you're just asking these personal questions time after time after time and in my opinion you're now getting to the point where you're being selfish do you, do you follow me and that's an issue of love and you're choosing to do it your fear drives you to it so the, the more I answer your questions the more I'm just feeding this addiction to allay your fear rather than you feel your fear so let's move on to someone else who wants to ask a question thanks Monique um, when you um, list all those things uh, choice faith I don't feel excited I feel very resistive well, why is that money um why, why doesn't it excite you that actually the lack of progress that i make is all dependent upon my own choice and decisions it's not dependent upon any external factor why isn't that exciting because that means that it's that means that it, all you have to do is change some things and and your life will change isn't that i oh, like i i think that's like it, if my life's decisions and choices were dependent upon your choices i'd be going oh boy i've got to wait till monique does it before i can do it that'd be terrible i i i, I want to do it for myself and i want to be able to do it as soon as i possibly can and if you have that attitude surely you'd be excited wouldn't you yes yes so what i'm suggesting is you don't have that attitude no no and and then the question becomes if you why don't i have that attitude mm. sometimes i feel that sometimes when the pain gets so much as in um my unloving my actions become so unloving uh, as in my actions are unloving and the pain inside of me becomes so much that i want to actually change that's we, we'll talk about this relationship later in our in a few days time because uh, what i see a lot of you doing is waiting until the pain is intense before you make a decision to change and that is, uh, that is a big problem isn't it like like if you keep doing that that it's a habit we've gotten into and and if you keep doing that then it could be many millennia before you change and in between that time you'll have a lot of pain like so this is a big issue and, and it's something we discuss in the pain and pleasure discussion that we have in a few days' time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can yeah. I ask one more sure you question? Can. Thank you. Um, the, I feel like when, when I do make the choice to actually um, confront an issue around love and there is a good feeling that comes, yeah. um, I guess that, that gives a bit of faith that it can be good but I guess I'm still not. I'm still not choosing that. I'm still not going. I'm still not holding on to that faith that it is good. So what's the question? Um, no question. Thank you. <laughs> I agree that you're not holding on to the faith that it, that what the previous experience has shown you is that you can have more faith and you can trust that, and you're not choosing to trust that. Now, why don't we choose to trust things? Well, it's because we don't want to take further action. We've got fears and it all boils down to the fact that we don't want to. So, so we've, got, we've got to stop going, I'm really confused because I think I want to. <laughs> like, honestly, we've got to stop doing that. I never tell myself that. I never go like, well, wow, like I've got this pain in my lower back. You know, I haven't got it today, but yesterday I had it, right? So yesterday I got this pain in my lower back while I'm talking to you. I'm not going... Ah, uh, you know, I really want to resolve this particular problem. I'm going, I don't want to, I obviously don't want to resolve that problem because it's a recurring problem. So what's going on for me? Why, why is this pain there? Uh, do I want to change that? I, I don't know what it's about, although that's not strictly true now because I've got more will to find out about it. I have had some inklings now about what it's about. I obviously don't want to feel the emotion that causes it. So I've got to allow myself to feel, well, why don't I want to feel the emotion that causes it? Does that make sense? Now I can do all of that while I'm talking to you. So you can do that, can't you? You can feel your pains and your, your thing, what's going on for you and feel what it's going to go and tell yourself that you don't want to. Why don't you want to? You can go through that inner dialogue if you wanted to. Right? And keep reminding yourself, God wants to show you what it is. 
God wants to deliver the truth to you about the issue and you're, you're just holding God back from doing that through the exercise of your will. And, it, and that's a lack of love of self, isn't it? That's, de that's about developing your will to love yourself. Because you would never deny your emotion if you really loved yourself fully. Would you? If you knew that your emotion is the key to unlocking not only all of your pleasure-based desires and happiness, but also unlocking all of the pains and releasing them, if you knew that, if you truly believed that, and you had faith in that, you would never want to lock them up, would you? So obviously we don't believe that, otherwise we'd do it. <laughs> so we've got to be truthful with ourselves and go, okay, I obviously don't believe that. Why don't I believe that? What's inside of me wants me to not believe that? What, what choices am I making to not believe that? We need to be honest with ourselves about these things. Does that make sense? Yeah? Felix? Oh. Oh. My apologies. I was just writing down something and I missed uh, two sentences. You, sa uh, you said, um, got to be honest or something about, about what? Just... Felix, there's a recording. The whole point of the recording is so that you go back and hear it again. Okay, no worries. Okay. <laughs> Good eye. All right, so, so the point of this discussion is we are choosing through the exercise of our will to do these things about these things. That's why we remain unloving. That's how we remain unloving. It's a choice we're making. And we need to see the choices we're making. So this is a key part of your analysis of yourself. Remember, your analysis of yourself is not to judge yourself. God loves you already. God already thinks you're worth everything. So you don't have to judge yourself here. What you've got to do is analyse yourself to see where you're blocking this person from loving you. Where you're blocking this being from communicating with you where you're blocking him from being able to share the truth with you. That's all you've got to do. So it's actually quite simple, but it is obviously emotions within you that cause you to do that. There's feelings within you that cause you to do that. And you need to learn how to analyse them and get down to them without judging yourself for them, without thinking your worth is being attacked when somebody talks about them and so forth. Does that make sense? Because God is willing to share with you that truth. Now, you remember some time ago, myself and Mary did a channeling of a man who lived in the Northern Territory. He was a farmer. Many of you heard that channeling. And, and remember, uh, I asked him to allow himself to feel a little bit of God's love, and he did. And, and he, he was overwhelmed by that, and he's, he cried, cried for a bit. And then, then I asked him how to, whether he would open his heart to let himself feel how God felt about how he treated his wife. Do you remember that? And what, you remember the next thing that happened? He, 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 he became immediately resistive. He said, well, that is, that is you know, extreme. I can't go there. It's extremely bad. That's what you guys are doing. God wants to show you the truth of everything and the things that feel bad, you're just shutting them down straight away. Right? And that's why God can't share the truth with you. Okay? Now, we're five minutes over, so I have to, have to stop this discussion. But hopefully you've seen the reason why and how you remain unloving. What we're going to do next is have a Q&A on that subject.